Welcome to the Lore Tours of Intergalactic Aerospace Expo 2951. This is where I walk the floor of IAE and tell you all about the history of the ships on display and their creators. Now join me on the floor for your tour. Welcome back to the floor with RSI Day, Robert Space Industries. I'm going to be telling you about the history of the ships and the manufacturer. Who is Robert Space Industries? What do they do? Why do they make stuff? So on and so forth. Well, in a bit of a meta reality here, Robert Space Industries was founded in 2038 on Earth in the Sol system by one Christopher Roberts. Christopher Rob Chris Roberts wanted to get involved into the space industry, but he didn't really have, it was too many other com competitors. He didn't really have an edge. So he built many other things, including um, alternative food resources and power plants and uh, upgraded certain other small technologies that already existed with his team uh, until 2061 when he was looking through to hire some new employees, looking through some recent doctoral graduates from some universities, he found one Dr. Robert Childress. Dr. Childress had a theory about near light travel that he called the quantum fusion engine. The idea to speed up travel immensely. Mr. Roberts really enjoyed this uh, this theory, thought this was going to be very, very good, and ended up uh, bringing Childress on and uh, helping him design the first quantum fusion engine and testing it, putting humanity on the map. Finally, uh, Robert Space Industries essentially jumped humanity forward hundreds of years with the quantum drive. The quantum drive effectively allowed for travel to the outer solar system, even the earlier versions allowed for travel to the outer, outer, outer solar system in a, a couple of days, whereas before it would take years to, to reach the outer, outer planets. So this kickstarts humanity to exploration into space and the colonization of Mars. And going forward, RSI became the premier spaceship and just techno technological uh, juggernaut and is heavily responsible for the formation of the UNE, the UPE, and the UEE. Its motto, as said from Chris Roberts, is learn from the past, reach for the future, fuel innovation, cultivate talent, and always be relevant. And those that last one specifically has been the big thing for RSI and managed to succeed pretty, pretty much hands down for over 800, nine, almost 900 years. Well, actually, over 900 years now. So, with that being said, let's take a look at some of these ships, starting with the Andromeda. Well, the Constellation. So here we have the series, uh, one of the tried and true series of ships for RSI, the Constellation or the Connie. The Constellation series is important because it came at a time uh, specifically uh, 2712, towards the end of the Meser era, where RSI was trying to focus more on the civilian market. Up to that point, RSI had been focusing um, heavily on military production, um, probably a little bit more than civilian production. Their civilian models were mostly just pleasure yachts for the, for the, so the super rich. But as... The, you know, the 2600s, they lost a lot of their the, that talent when Case Aerospace was formed. If you want to know about Case Aerospace, we talked about that in the last video. Uh, so they were trying to focus more on the military, and then the Mezers were getting more and more brutal. Eventually, the RSI themselves stepped forward and denounced um, a, a major event in history called uh, the death of Anthony Tanaka. Um, they they did a major overhaul of who was building their parts and materials, and this made them very uh, persona non grata with uh, <laughs> with the, with the Mezers. As a result, they had started to shift over to more civilian production. But up until this point, RSI's civilian productions, other than the luxury systems, were pretty much ad hoc. They kind of put together things for what they wanted to, you know, what they needed to be done. An explorer ship was an explorer ship. A cargo hauler was a cargo hauler, but they realized that the future was going to be in multi-use craft, a craft that was versatile and could be used for multiple different uh, different things. 
So we're going to start over here, I believe, with the... This is the Andromeda here, I believe. Yes, Constellation Andromeda. So this was the base model, the, the first model that was built. It was uh, built and rebuilt, though the first Andromedas came off the assembly line, assembly, assembly line on 2712 over 339 years ago. This ship was built to be a large but flexible ship. It could be a cargo hauler. It could carry for exploration purposes. It has plenty of space for bedrooms, uh, for long storage, and it even comes with its own snubcraft, the P-52 Merlin. Now, the Merlin wasn't there in the original conning designs, as far as I can tell. The first couple of designs did not have a Merlin attached. It was only in the late 3rd, 29th and early 30th centuries that Kruger Intergalactic, a major parts manufacturer for Robert Space Industries, asked that they could build their own ship. RSI was very keen on this because they were redesigning the Connie series from the ground up and they thought it would be a great idea to add a snub craft to the Connie to make it even more versatile. Thus, Kruger came up with two specific ships, their first ships they ever built, which was the P-52 Merlin and the P-70, P-50, yeah, P-52 Merlin and P-72 Archimedes, I believe. And the Archimedes is there for the, for the luxury version, but the P-52 is on almost all of RSI's Connie line today. Now, because of the flexibility of the frame and because of the kind of push in the, the 29th and 30th century that many uh, aerospace manufacturers were going for, use the same hull but differentiate, specialize the design, the Connie has also gotten many variants over the years. Over here we see the constellation uh, Aquila. Aquila. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Whenever I say it, someone like Darge always tries to correct me. Uh, the Aquila, the Aquila, uh, which is a exploration variant. It has higher uh, fuel tanks. It has a different uh, canopy in the front. And it also comes standard with an RSI Ursa Rover as well as a P-52 Merlin. So, or it might be P-51 Merlin uh, with a Merlin. So this was one example. Uh, another example over here is uh, it's continuing tradition of a luxury spacecraft. They created a version of the Connie, which is for luxury passengers called the Phoenix. This is the one that has the Archimedes in it. Uh, and it comes standard with, I believe, a Lynx rover, which has not been released into the universe quite yet. And last but not least, we have the workhorse, the stripped down, no frills budget model, which is the Constellation Taurus. This is a, a cargo hauling variant with a slightly elongated hull for extra uh, storage capacity, plus it ripped out the Merlin for more storage space. And its bottom turret here is replaced with a twin tractor beams to help load and offload cargo pretty quickly. So this is kind of shows you the flexibility and what RSI has been trying to do in the last, I'd say, 150 years is for civilian multi-purpose crafts. They don't tend to do a lot of dedicated ships anymore uh, without specific calls for it from the military or from security forces. So that is the Connie's. Let's go talk about the, probably the, not the oldest, but well, we'll talk about it. Come join us. The word I was looking for was venerable, I think. The venerable RSI Aurora. Now, the Aurora series is venerable in that it is the descendant of the first ever spacecraft to travel, successfully travel a jump point and return. That was the X-7. So the Aurora is the great, 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 great grandson of the X-7. Uh, it, it shares much of its similar original design from its sh shape and its style uh, to its uh, to its size. Um, the original X-7 was an experimental craft that was designed for one person specifically to travel through a jump point. And the Auroras continue to do their jobs effectively, and because it's such an older design with some minor upgrades, it is incredibly affordable. It is, it is probably the most uh, common ship you will see 
in the verse in terms of uh, civilian craft. Pretty much, uh, it's not too far off that most people who are middle class or above will have an Aurora just for travel. And the fact that it can travel across vast, vast distances and go through jump points is a pretty nice little thing for a small little commuter ship. Uh, because it's been around for so long, the Aurora has had many variants, and each time the Aurora has been uh, Aurora has been built, they've kind of continued to add more chassis, new new types of Auroras. The original Aurora and the base Aurora you'll get today is the MR, which has a couple of guns, some missiles, and a cargo bay in the back for exterior cargo traveling, with its own little bed on board as well. But they've also made several other types, including the Aurora uh, LX, which is the luxury version, leather seats, as uh, my viewers like to say. Uh, it's like putting leather seats in a, uh, in a Lada. <laughs> for, for my Eastern European viewers, we get that joke. Uh, and uh, then the LN, the Legionnaire. Uh, the Legionnaire is sort of the hybrid of a bunch of the other ones, but it is a militia ship. It's built specifically with the idea of selling as a cheap fighter for frontier militia because much like other militia ships it's easy to repair because they're so common in the verse uh, and uh, with the a little bit of additional firepower with additional guns on the wings and uh, a slightly upgraded i believe upgraded power plant or, or shield i could be wrong with that uh, it is a nasty thing to fight against good to use soon here mantis All right, this is the Clipper, the Aurora CL. This is the uh, variant that they came out with that was designed specifically for long haul transportation. It has its own uh, extended cargo bay in here, comes standard with a, with a larger cargo bay to car carry more uh, material. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, I think it also has a little bit bigger quantum travel as well, because it's also sort of a uh, exploration variant. And that could also be the LX. And lastly, the but budget version, the absolute stripped down version, which I don't think even comes with. Yeah, it comes with different uh, outlooks, but it's even cheaper than the MR, which is the ES. Absolutely no frills version of the Aurora. With the Aurora, let's come talk about the the probably the most specialized ship outside of the capital ships that RSI has built. We have the RSI Mantis. Now, there's not a lot of lore about when the Mantis was built, but we know why it was built. The Mantis is specifically designed for quantum enforcement. That is for security and military forces to be able to blockade or stop specific areas or ships from coming in and going. You can think of this as like a spike strip in space. It's able to pull tr uh, ships out of quantum travel and then keep them from going back into quantum travel through two different devices. Now, there are ships like the uh, Drake Cutlass, or Jake Cutlass Blue, which has the ability to prevent ships from going into quantum, but this is the only ship that we know of that is the ability to pull ships out of quantum. The Mantis itself is uh, highly used in the UEE by the, by the advocacy security forces and the UEE Navy itself. Uh, to enforce blockades or to just stop criminals or possible criminals from coming and going. Uh, it is not very well armed, but that's not its job. Its job is to stop people from running. Uh, and for those of you who are wondering, the understanding right now of how the lore works for this is that uh, in quantum travel, your ship is ex constantly scanning for long range, um, long range uh, obstacles. And if it reaches, if it registers an obstacle, obstacles, it does an emergency stop and pulls you out of quantum as fast as possible, which then pulls you into, um, you know, stops you in space. This is how if you've if you've been quantuming and you, you uh, get pulled out of space and you see like a, a wreck and sometimes f fighters will f come out of the wreck and attack you. That's because that's what pirates will do. They will take a wreck. They will move a wreck into a quantum, tra highly traveled quantum area. And then when you get pulled out, they attack you. So. Um, that might change in the future for the lore, but that's what this does. This mimics a giant disturbance, like a gravitational disturbance for a quantum um, engine. It, it tricks the computer into thinking that there is an obstacle in the way, which it pulls it out. So, 
All right, and then um, let's go talk about some of the, the ground vehicles as well as the future of RSI. All right, we're descending the stairs to look at the RSI Ursa rover. Now, we know RSI from its spaceships, but in reality, Robert Space Industries is not just a spaceship manufacturer. They produce, as a result, for instance, their first developed major breakthrough was the Quantum Drive as an engine. And can they continue to work on engines as well? But they also revolutionized terraforming technology, um, armor, long-range spacesuits, underwear. RSI makes a lot of equipment in the Star Citizen universe. There's a reason why I say they're probably the most powerful company in the entire UEE, because much of the UEE is dependent on RSI technology and RSI resources and, 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 and items. So the Ursa, for instance, is used by military and civilians alike. It's used for exploration purposes, as for scouting purposes. It's designed to be a rugged, uh, easy to uh, to drive, uh, able to survive on multiple surfaces because, funny story, around the same time as the creation of the constellation between the 28th and 29th century, there was um, a company known as Tumbrel, which we'll talk about here in the future, that had existed on life support, limping along, was which was the main source of ground transportation. But they collapsed during this time period. So there was really no ground transportation vehicle company that existed, which is the reason why RSI and Anvil both built their own ground transportation vehicles. Anvil built its Atlas chassis, and RSI built the Ursa. Uh, so these are essentially an attempt to fill in the gaps from old Tumbrel's dis, um, kind of dissolution. Now that Tumbrel is back into the scene, we don't see a ton of new ships, of ground vehicles, but we may still start, start seeing a little bit more of a competition between groups like RSI and uh, RSI, um, Anvil, and Tumbrel for, for more ground vehicles. So the Ursa was developed alongside with the, with the Constellation program. Uh, specifically for it, but it is used in multiple other um, instances, as well as uh, I believe the Carrick comes standard with it now as well. So yeah, that's the that's the Ursa rover. It's a it's a small six wheel rover. It has guns that can be uh, deployed. It's in size two size ones on the side right here that are deployed and can be used by a co pilot or a co co driver. You have a driver and a co driver, uh, and then there's four seats in the back. So I don't think there's anything else on the other side. Sitting room. All right, let's go into the future of RSI, which in some cases is the past of RSI. Start here with the RSI, say this right. I don't want to say it's the Black Widow because that's the wrong name for it. Scorpius, the Scorpius. The two fighter, two seater fighter from RSI, heavy fighter designed specifically to counter the Vanduul. Now, it's a little unsure right now because there are two different, right now it seems like there's two different competitions named the same thing in lore. But the competition that was, um, that found the F8, essentially the competition to replace the F7, which was held, which was the next generation starfighter had three entries. One was the F-8. Another was called the um, Dogfighter 3000. And one was called the uh, RSI Black Widow. Now, it may be that the Sabre is the Dogfighter 3000 and the Scorpius is the Black Widow. We don't quite know, but as far as I'm concerned, that is the lore right now, that this is the Black Widow that was eventually brought into the um, UEE as its own fighter. Uh, but this is a unique kind of change in RSI style. Before this, RSI essentially had three divisions, a consumer division, a civilian division, and a military division. The consumer division dealt with things like spacesuits and the Ursa rovers and those sorts of things. The civilian division dealt with just civilian spaceships like the Constellation and the Aurora, and the military division built things like the RSI Bengal, the Pegasus, the Polaris, and so on. This is a military ship which was also released to the civilian market. 
Anvil Industries really disrupted a lot of what was, do, uh, you know, practices that were happening uh, before um, the Mezer, during the Mezer era, with ships being released uh, either as military and then being sold as surplus or civilian and maybe be purchased by some of them by, and used by, by uh, the military forces. This was built for the military, but was also sold to civilians at the same time. So while we don't have a ton of lore on it, we do know that it is kind of a, a new version, a new generation, uh, a new way of doing things for RSI, uh, f following along with Anvil and even Aegis in their own designs. So two-seater fighter designed to fight the Vanduul. Then we have officially the oldest ship in the Star Citizen universe that is still around that we know of. The RSI Perseus. Now the Perseus was built in 2520 or in the 2520s, specifically because as the UPE was expanding and taking over from the UNE, they realized they needed some way of maintaining the peace on the frontier. There are many different planets with many different cultures from many different you know, had the origins from many different uh, uh, peoples around <coughs> around the, the the world and around the solar system, and sometimes even around the entire ga uh, galaxy. Well, yeah, the entire galaxy. So these peoples did not have a lot in common, and there was a lot of uh, conflict. Especially since the end of the unification wars in the UNE, many pirate organizations who had, or many of the rebel organizations became pirate organizations and continued to fight against the UNE and the UPE. So they needed something that could stop a fight before it started, but was cheap enough and easy enough to build and also still fight if it needed to. That was the Perseus. The Perseus is designed to look mean. It's designed to stop fights without firing a shot. In fact, it lived up to its reputation when its first deployment to a kind of riots and rebellion that was going, or riots that turned into a rebellion, it showed up into the system and the, the people who were in the riots just went home. They just, they were like, nope, not gonna fight that. <laughs> uh, just because it looks mean. And uh, it's also known as the, as the subcap slayer because it's got two twin um, turrets, size seven turrets um, on e either side. I believe they're ballistic. Plus it also has several size five torpedoes. And here on the back, you see it has an automated missile defense turret to defend against it. Now, this was ship was built before the first Tavaran war. And it served in the first and second of Iron War and served with distinction along the Perry line, the frontier between the Xi'an and humans, to continue its um, look tough, be mean, and stop someone before they throw a punch um, kind of reputation. It's where That's really where it continued to grow and, and become the ship that stops wars. But it was aging. It was... It had some retrofits, it had some updates, but it was uh, like they stopped building the Perseuses in the 27th century and they really didn't build new ones, but they still were in service somewhere in mothballs, so on and so forth. And it wasn't until the Battle of, what is the battle again? Operation Mandrake, um, which was Oberon, I think. Yeah, Oberon. During the Battle of Oberon, um, uh, AKA Operation Mandrake, when the UE deployed uh, a massive fleet to stop a incoming Vanduul fleet, which they had kind of figured was coming, that the Perseus really began to see its new uh, rebirth. The UES Achilles was deployed along the line uh, uh, along the line against the Vanduul in a very vulnerable location. It was left alone at a key point in the battle and was uh, was forced to take on multiple Vanduul destroyers ships that were way that way outclassed it in every way shape and form but it managed to survive long enough to disable two vanduul two of these vanduul destroyers before it was disabled itself a complete upset in terms of tonnage and when the investigation as to how the achilles managed to do this came in it became pretty clear the the perseus was designed before shields were available for ships this size so it is far heavier than it should be for a ship of its size. It has a lot of armor. 
And because the Vanduul tend to favor close in engagements and even melee attacks with their ships, the armor did a good job of deflecting and, and defending against these more brute force attacks while still being able to hit hard because these are bigger ships that are getting in close to do melee attacks with a gun with ships that have guns that can just tear through subcaps and do some damage to, to, to capital ships. And they don't have to really aim at that point. They can just fire. Uh, combined with torpedoes and its own anti-missile defense system, it was very, very difficult to kill. It was so impressed. Uh, it was so impressive. Its performance was so impressive that uh, Admiral Bishop personally asked RSI to reintroduce the Perseus to help with civilian and military process processes. Thus, we have the rebirth of the new RSI Perseus being sold and being built today to come out to the front lines. Lastly, we have the newest ship in RSI's fleet, the RSI Polaris. Now, the Polaris is a missile boat. She is essentially kind of a replacement for the, uh, the Idris. She's a little smaller than the Idris. Uh, she's designed with one, one entire idea in mind, to kill king ships. Her job is to go in and have enough firepower to destroy the biggest Vandal threat that exists. Now, kingships have only shown up like three or four times in human history. So we're using a lot of, sorry, itchy nose. Um, we're using a lot of outdated information, but the Polaris is designed to be quick, skimp on the armor but with, and, and guns, but have nothing but size 10 or size 11 torpedoes to just absolutely devastate its enemies. But they're built because they're light ships and they're smaller ships. They can also be deployed for home defense and work very well combined with Perseus's and Hammerheads to help, you know, create small fleets to patrol and enforce UEE law you know, where they need to. So they're flexible enough to be used, they're flexible enough to be used uh, at home, the home front and devastatingly enough to be used in larger fleet, fleets against larger targets. It's designed to Punch above, punch above its weight class, effectively. Uh, but these were first built in 2946, and they're still being weighted. Or they're still slowly coming out to the UEE forces. So we won't see this in the Squadron 42 game, and we're still waiting for it to come out here in the verse for the civilian market as well. So, and that's it for RSI Day. Thank you so much for watching this. If you're watching this on YouTube, we I recorded this live on Twitch. Uh, we do this. Uh, every day, uh, I'm not going to be live on Twitch every day, but we do um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We do the the you know just kind of regular streams. I do my own captain's table on Saturdays to so come talking about Star Citizen, and of course we do uh, I do Galactic Historian videos. If you want to know more about any of these ships or anything else, there's over a hundred videos on that playlist of just. Lore. <laughs> lore, lore for Star Citizen, from weapons to manufacturers to ships to individuals. So check that out. Um, and if you like long form, more casual conversations, I also have my Lore Citizen podcast with Jail and Algrid. We do that once a month. Um, check that out in the podcast. It's also in podcast form as well as in the uh, in playlist here as well. So if you like this, like the video. Please subscribe to, for more information like this. Make sure you hit the bell icon if you want to know when these come out. And when you hit the bell icon, click on it again because there's a little, little thing. You have to hit all notifications because if you don't do that, then YouTube doesn't send, send you the information but, that, that I've uploaded a video. So do that. And like I say every time, nope, I keep screwing that up. <laughs> and remember, Exhistoria at Astra.